It is now time for question period. The Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Acting Premier. On May 12, the Minister of the Environment said, Home heating is going to have to come from sources other than natural gas. This week, the member from Beaches East York said this is about getting people off fossil fuels and on to electricity. Mr. Speaker, this government is forcing the people of Ontario to convert from natural gas to electricity for home heating. Mr. Speaker, that will mean that families will have to pay an additional $3,000 a year to heat their homes. To the acting premier, Mr. Speaker, do you, do they, does this government really think that Ontario families can afford $3,000 more a year on their already exorbitant bills? Thank you, Speaker, and I want to say thank you to the Leader of the Opposition for asking this question, because it gives us an opportunity to very clearly say we are not forcing homeowners off natural gas. Full stop. Full stop, Speaker. The question is based on a, on a, um, a twisting, Speaker. They're twisting, uh, twerking, trying to rile people up. We are not forcing people off natural gas. <clears throat> Thank you. Supplementary. Mr. Speaker, again to the Acting Premier, and uh, obviously the Acting Premier is going to need to explain their new position on natural gas to the Minister of the Environment and to the member for Beaches East York. So, back to the government's plan to eliminate Order. natural gas and what it's going to mean for Ontario's small businesses. Deputy Jamie Heaton employs 21 people in North Bay, owns a company, Bavarian Link Meat Products. His electricity costs are more than $110,000 a year, the second largest cost member from Beaches East York. salaries. To keep costs down, he says they cook mostly with natural gas. He said if he could reduce hydro costs by 50 per cent, he could expand his business and create new jobs. But not only are hydro rates going to keep him from expanding his business, the plan to eliminate natural gas will kill jobs and put him out of business. So, Mr. Speaker, the question to the acting premier is Thank you. come clean on your plan. Be Be seated, please. Thank you. The member from Chatham, Kent, Essex, come to order. If you say it again, you'll get a second one. Deputy Premier. So, Speaker, let me try again. We will not be forcing people off natural gas. Full stop. In fact, Speaker, we are expanding access to natural gas. In 2015, we announced $230 million to expand access to natural gas to rural Ontario. This is great news, and I actually think the Leader of the Opposition— All of you are not helping me. The member from Leeds Grenville will come to order. And the member from Prince Edward Hastings will come to order. I've got a good memory. And I also got keen ears, and if you say it again, you'll get a second. Please. I think the Leader of the Opposition needs to, ex to support our expansion of natural gas into communities that do not have the benefit of that. The member from Leeds Grenville, second time. You have one wrap up sentence. We will not be forcing people to uh, eliminate natural gas. Yeah. We will not. The member from Huron-Bruce, come to order. Final supplementary. 
Mr. Speaker, it's almost comical seeing the Liberal cabinet twist and turn on this position. And maybe the acting premier can inform the Minister of the Environment that his plan is no longer supported by the government. Mr. Speaker, how else can the acting premier explain this Liberal natural gas leak? Because according to the Globe and Mail, this government plans on, on eliminating natural gas. Are you saying, Mr. Speaker, is the acting premier Member saying Barry, the Globe and Mail Minister of Transportation, come to order. Because it is very clear that this will cost jobs. It is very clear that this would be disastrous for Ontario. So if the Globe and Mail article is incorrect, I expect the acting premier to say that very clearly because the statements by the Minister of the Environment are a direct contradiction to what the acting premier is saying. Please go on the record and say what plan is accurate, yours or the Minister of the Environment? Thank you. Deputy Premier. So, Speaker, let me try this one more time, and I will say this slowly and clearly. We are not forcing anyone off natural gas. In fact, we are expanding access to natural gas. The Leader of the Opposition and his caucus just should be celebrating this clarity. I speak for our entire government. The member from Renfrew come to order, and I'm about uh, maybe 60 seconds away from going to warnings, and some of you are close enough to get named. We will have no wow about it. We will have order. So, Speaker, the uh, opposition party can stop their uh, worrying about Answer. this. We will not be forcing anyone off natural gas. In fact, we are expanding access to natural gas. Thank you. New question. The member from Nipissing. Thank you and good morning, Speaker. My question is for the Deputy Premier. This government would have us believe that there's nothing it can do or could have done to mitigate skyrocketing hydro costs. But now we know that's simply not true. More gas plant scandal documents related to the Samsung deal now reveal a very different story. They outline that when Samsung missed their deadlines, the government could have walked away from the multi-billion dollar deal for nothing. The ministry states the savings would have been about $30 a year on the average residential bill. Instead, the government did what was best for the Liberal Party and not for the people of Ontario. Speaker, my question is, why did the government choose their corporate friends over the interests of Ontario ratepayers? Mr. Finance. Mr. Finance. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Our government is indeed committed to renewable energy, and we've built a strong track record with many successes. Uh, to the success, of course. Member from Chatham Kent Essex, second time. Finish. Mr. Speaker, because of the programs that we've instituted, we're creating well paying manufacturing jobs across the province. In fact, the Minister of Energy was in Tilsonburg a few weeks ago where he announced a new export agreement with Siemens Canada. We're building wind turbine blades that will be exported to the UK. That's 300 well paying jobs at that facility and 600 other indirect jobs that are supported by that project. And at the same time, yes, as the opposition has pointed out very clearly this morning, our government has also taken action to reduce overall electricity system costs, renegotiated with the Green Energy Investment Agreement, saving $3.7 billion. Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, back to the deputy. The gas plant scandal documents are clear. It notes Samsung is, quote, missing multiple milestone deadlines, and this, quote, triggers the province's ability to terminate without penalty through existing termination clauses. Speaker, the document further states, quote, the ministry is now proposing to eliminate much of the existing agreement. The ministry argues that doing so would save the Ontario tax ratepayers as much as $5.2 billion. But instead of taking the ministry's advice and doing right by Ontario's family, they only cancelled, as the minister just said, $3.7 billion worth. The
The government left $1.5 billion on the table. I asked the same question. question. Why did the government choose their corporate friends over the interests of Ontario's ratepayers? Thank you. Minister? Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, in fact, the Ministry of Energy did indeed revise the Green Energy Aid Investment Act in 2013. The revised agreement includes protecting the Samsung's agreement and commitments to jobs and adding a commitment to solar manufacturing jobs in 2016, reducing the agreement's total commitment for renewable projects from 2,500 megawatts to 1,369 megawatts, and requiring Samsung to obtain municipal council support resolutions for renewable energy projects before moving forward. Samsung has now opened four manufacturing plants across the province, which will create 900 indirect jobs. All of the projects contracted now are online, and the Samsung agreement has resulted in local benefits as well, including Samsung's $11.5 million program for the benefit of the community of Chatham-Kent. And Samsung has partnered with the Canadian Solar to open a London solar plant. The, matter, the member from Chatham-Kent, Essex, is warned. Oh, no, you can't just blurt it out. The, the agreement is ongoing, and the ongoing portion of that agreement is more manufacturing plants, more solar panels, and is supplying the projects which is sorely needed sir. in our province. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Back to the deputy. These gas plant scandal documents continue to paint a picture of the inner workings of the Liberal government. They show the government could have terminated the remainder of the Samsung deal and saved the ratepayers $5.2 billion and brought relief to hydro bills. But the document went on to say, contrary to what the minister just said, quote, Ontario has more generation capacity than it requires, and the ministry presents this rationale for not proceeding with future phases. Quote, the bureaucrats knew that walking away was in the best interest of the people of Ontario, but the government only cancels a part of the deal and leaves a billion and a half dollars on the table. I ask again. Why did this government choose their corporate friends Question. over the interests of Ontario families? Thank you. Seated, please. The government, uh, the deputy house leader is. The deputy house leader, second time. Minister. Mr. Speaker. The government is choosing emissions-free technology, emissions-free emissions, and more jobs for the people of Ontario. That's what's being created by the ongoing agreement with Samsung. 90% emissions-free is now being generated through wind, solar, nuclear, hydroelectricity, and bioenergy. And 42,000 more jobs are being created as a result of 30 wind and solar manufacturing operations in our communities. Mr. Speaker, we are improving overall system costs beyond the renegotiation of the Samsung agreement, which is saving 3. $7 billion over the life of the contract. We mandated annual reviews of feed-in tariff, which pricing will result in ratepayer savings of $1.9 billion over the life of those contracts. And moving forward on a procurement of future large energy projects, that process is expected to eliminate $3.3 billion additional benefits in the system, saving the average Ontario family $20 annually on their bills compared to the 2013 long-term projections. We're benefiting the communities. New question. The member from Nickelbelt. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for this Premier. I ask the Deputy Premier about the fact that mental health beds across Ontario hospitals are chronically overcrowded. The Deputy Premier shamefully refused to even acknowledge this fact or that we had a problem. But according to the facts, Speaker, hospitals in Ontario are being stretched to 110, 120, and sometimes 130 per cent of their mental health capacity. I have a simple question that deserve an answer, Speaker. Will the acting Premier admit that it is unsafe to let hospital occupancy get anywhere near 100 per cent, let alone higher than that, yes or no? Thank you, Deputy Premier. 
Uh, speaker, what we do absolutely know is that we must continue to expand services in the community outside of hospitals. We must support our hospitals. That's why we increase funding to hospitals in this budget, Speaker. We are also focusing significant attention and significant funding on building, uh, so building services outside the hospital. One example, Speaker, that I think resonates with everyone in the House is our commitment to expand palliative care and hospice care in the community. What that means is that people who currently are dying in hospitals can be moved or can be in a hospice in Order. a community setting where they have a much more dignified experience, as do their families. That's the kind of health care system we are building, Speaker, one where people receive the health care that they need in the best possible place. Two supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. The Deputy Premier says that health care should be evidence-based. It should be based on facts. Here are some facts, speakers, that come right out of the government's book themselves. In the last quarter alone, the hospital in Burlington went as 118 capacity for its mental health bed. In London, 100 per cent. Sault Ste. Marie, 100 per cent. St. Catherine in Ottawa, 100 per cent. In Thunder Bay Hospital, one was at 103 and the other at 105 per cent wow. capacity. Will the Deputy Premier look at her own number and admit that Ontario's mental health beds are dangerously overcrowded? Speaker, I, th I think the, um, the difference between the approach that we are taking here and the approach that the opposition, the third party, is taking is that they believe that uh, uh, people are always best served in hospital, where we believe because we recognize challenges, Speaker, we need to expand community capacity, and that is exactly what we're doing. Another way that I'm very proud of the progress that we're making uh, when it comes to people with mental illness is in support of housing. <laughs> we know that there are people who are in hospital, in mental health beds, who could be better served outside the hospital, in the community, and that's why we're building capacity outside the community to take pressure off hospitals and also, Speaker, to provide Answer. the highest quality of care for those particular people. Thank you. Su final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Well, the Liberals cannot deny the facts. New Democrat obtained through Freedom of Information the government's own numbers, and they revealed that acute care beds are overcrowded throughout our province. They reveal that mental health beds are overcrowded throughout our province. And cutting more nurses, cutting more services, and cutting more beds is only making things worse, not better. It will make things worse for pa patients in London, make things worse for people and patients in Hamilton, in North Bay, and right across the GTA. When will this Liberal government admit there is a silent crisis in our hospital and stop the cuts to frontline care. Thank you. Thank you so well, Speaker, the, 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 um, the uh, member opposite actually, um, I thought in her first two questions, were pretty thoughtful. When she moves to allegations that we are cutting health care, that is where she is completely wrong, and the numbers speak for themselves. This budget alone, we've added $1 billion to health care spending. That is an undeniable fact. Another fact that I think is really important for people to understand is that we are adding nurses. We have added 26,000 nurses to our health care sector, Speaker, over the past 12 years. That is a significant increase in, in, uh, in, in care for patients, and we're getting outcomes, Speaker. In fact, ISIS, the Answer. Institute for Clinical Evaluative Studies, has found that our changes in health care has increased the numbers of patients being treated and Thank reduced you. the average length of stay. Getting Thank you. New question, the, leader from, uh, the member from Nickel Belt. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Ma deuxième... Thank you. It's a, also for the Deputy Premier. Yesterday, I joined my leader, Andrea Horvat, at a hospital in Scarborough. The ER we visited was built for 20,000 people per year, but is handling 65,000 people. And for half of last year, the Rouge Order. Valley Scarborough Hospital was running at over 100 per cent capacity. Healthcare in Scarborough is stretched really thin, Speaker. 
Will the Liberal government agree that, at a very minimum, hospital funding should keep up with inflation and the growing population each and every year? Thank you. Well, Speaker, what's really important to me is the outcomes for patients, because that's what our whole health care system is all about, Speaker. And um, the SEIU, and I know there's some people from SEIU here today, and welcome to the Legislature. Um, they, did a study, they did a study on the Canadian health care system in 2014, and they, the conclusion they came to was this. When it comes to spending our health care dollars wisely and efficiently, Ontario and Quebec are in the front of the pack, Speaker. Um, the Fraser Institute's uh, report on wait times revealed that Ontario has the second shortest overall wait times in Canada, and in fact, we've gone from the worst to the best when it comes to hip and knee replacements, cataracts, cardiac care, radiation oncology, MRIs, CT scans, and ultrasounds. So, Speaker, what matters yes, to me is that patients are getting the care they need more quickly with a higher level of quality, Speaker. As I've said Thank before, you. the system is in trans. Supplementary. Well, yesterday we met their cardiologist. He told us that the lack of funding for their cardiac catheterization lab at Centenary Hospital means patients cannot get the preventative cardiac care that they need. And because they don't get Order. the preventative care, they need up ending more invasive, more high-risk surgery down the road. Will the acting premier stop the cuts to our hospital so that patients can get the access they need and the hospital care they need? Thank you. Well, Speaker, I mean, it's interesting that we're, I guess we'll be talking a lot about Scarborough over the next little while, but uh, I do want to say that our candidates, uh, our members the member from Scarborough Hamilton Mountain come to order. have been very strong advocates for the health care system. Like me, they're they are committed to a health care system that puts patients first. So, Speaker, we are increasing our investment in health care every single year. We have done that. They are making claims that simply are not true about cuts to our system. The reality is hospital funding has increased by 53 per cent since 2003. We are increasing funding for every single hospital in the province of Ontario this year. That's part of our $1 billion increase to health care spending. So when we are increasing funding in Scarborough, $4.5 million for Rouge Valley Health System, $2.9 million in Scarborough, $2.6 at Lake Thank you. Speaker. We're making it. Final supplementary. Hospitals throughout the GTA are overcrowded. Centenary Hospital in Scarborough is only one of so many examples. The ER sees three times more patients than it was billed for. More often than not, there is no acute care beds available to admit anybody from the ER. Doctor feels that the system is stretched beyond the limit. This is a healthcare system in crisis, Speaker. When will the Deputy Premier admit that the crisis in health care and stop the cut to our hospitals. Thank you. That's the premier. Well, Speaker, once again, I think there are facts here that are actually indisputable. There are no cuts to hospitals. There is, in fact, a significant increase to hospital funding this year, Speaker, and we have increased funding in, in the uh, past as well. We are getting outcomes for patients that are demonstrating that people who work in our health care system are working very, very hard to provide better quality of care. We're seeing infection rates coming down in our hospitals. We're seeing higher quality of care in our hospitals. The impact of the Excellent Care for All Act is actually visible now as hospitals re report improvements in quality of care. That's what patients are looking for. They want access to care in a timely way, and when they get yes, that care, they want it to be of the highest possible quality. Thank you. No question. The member from the and Carlton. My question is uh, to the Deputy Premier. Yesterday's Ottawa, Ottawa Auditor, Auditor General's report uh, was quite stunning on the secret union payouts. Um, the auditor said Ontario is an outlier with respect to the, this use of taxpayer funds. We also found out in this report that there is no evidence of the Ontario government. Um, you want to go? 
The Deputy House Leader is warned. Finish, please. We also found out that there's no evidence the Ontario government has paid any other public sector union uh, for bargaining costs in Ontario. So just a quick recap. An outlier in Canada, no other bargaining costs were covered in any other sector, and it adds up as well as your net zeros do in the Treasury Board. So my question, Speaker, is are the Liberals ashamed that they took the money from the classroom? Because not only is this not done in any other sector in Ontario, question. it's a one-of-a-kind deal in the rest of Canada. Well, Speaker, um, despite attempts to be the new PC party, this is a really solid reminder that the old PC party still rules, Speaker. Speaker, and we completely disagree with them. We actually believe that investing in teachers, investing in professional development has a positive impact on kids in the classroom. So we're proud of our investments in professional know development. The member from Prince Edward Hastings will withdraw. I know my rules. To your seat, please, to withdraw. 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 Thank you. Uh, look, bring it down a notch. Carry on. My question, does the member opposite really believe that teachers should not be— member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Does the member opposite believe that teachers should not be trained in things like bullying prevention, in uh, how to work with kids with special needs, in how to teach mathematics in a way that improves those math scores? Training teachers is an important part of having a strong education system. Answer. The results speak for itself. When, you were in when they were in charge, the speaker, the graduation that. rate in high school was a shameful 68 percent, and it is now over 80 percent. Thank you. I can tell you one thing. Bill Davis would never have taken $80 million out of the kids in classrooms. And I can tell you another thing. Bill Davis never would have stood up. Please finish. I'll tell you something else Bill Davis never would have done. He would never have threatened kids in demonstration schools for the deaf and the blind. He never would have cut them off of IBI, ABH uh, wait lists. He wouldn't ensure that rural schools and urban schools across this province were going to be cut. No, no, no. The party of Bill Davis would never have done that. But the party of Kathleen Wynne and Dr. McGinty sure as heck did. So I asked the Premier, the Deputy Premier, one more time. What could that $90 million been spent on? Question. Kissing classrooms or more transfers to unions? Can you it, please? Can you it, please? Thank you. Minister of Transportation, second time. Now we'll move to warnings, and I'll give them out like candy if you want them. Uh, yes, quite frankly, and the ones that have been warned, the next one's a naming. Carry in, please. To the Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you very much, and um, I think I think it's actually time to reflect on how Ontario's teacher unions were originally set up. They were set up as federations who didn't bargain under the Labor, Labor Relations Act. They were set up with the capacity to bargain. The member from Renfrew Nipissing-Pembroke is warned. 
carry on. They were set up with bargaining departments and with a professional development part department. And do you know who set them up that oh. way? Oh. Premier Bill Davis set them up. didn't believe in professional teachers for David, for teachers. We Thank actually you. are lying. Minister, I stand you sit. New question, the member from Kitchener, Waterloo. Thank you, very, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Last year, the government changed the Government Advertising Act so that they could run partisan governments' ads. We see them all the time. As Ontario's nonpartisan Auditor General wrote, the government could flood the province with self-congratulatory and self-promotional advertising that would be of little practical use to the citizens paying for it. The new electoral rules will limit anyone who wants to criticize them during an election and the six months before, but they will allow the government to spend millions and flood the province with partisan ads during an election and the six months before. Those are the rules. Are the Liberals so desperate that they'll limit the speech of non-partisan citizens from in Lawrence the province of Ontario? That's right. Thank you. Thank you. Wow, they want uh, speaker, we, um, we're very proud of the uh, legislation that we have uh, when it comes to banning partisan government. The member for Stormont, Dundas and South Glengarry is warned. He's going to do what I said. <coughs> Finish, please. One of the first things we did when we were elected in 2003, Speaker, was to actually bring in legislation to ban partisan ads because we had seen such a blatant misuse of taxpayers' money from the previous government, Speaker. So we're proud of that. We're one of the very few jurisdictions in the whole world. Member from Hamilton East Stony Creek is warned. Finish, please. We're one of the few jurisdictions in the entire world to have legislation that bans uh, a partisan ad speaker, and we're proud of that distinction. Thank you. So, Mr. Speaker, uh, the Liberals' new rules don't just limit third-party ads about political parties or politicians. These new rules clamp down on any issue of public interest. The new rules will silence climate change groups, nonpartisan citizen groups, parents concerned with autism, people fighting for pensions or fighting for lower hydro bills, nurses concerned about the cuts in the health care system. All will have their right to free speech limited. At the same time as the government can flood the airwaves and bus shelters and newspaper ad pages with partisan government advertising, can the Deputy Premier explain why there's one set of rules for seniors fighting for pensions and another set of rules for the Ontario Liberal Party. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Government House Leader. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. It is clearly obvious now that the NDP do not want to reform election financing rule in the province of Ontario. From the beginning, Speaker, from the beginning, Speaker, they are trying to slow down and stall the process. Perhaps they want to justify and continue to do their big $10,000 fundraisers like the one they're going to be doing in Ottawa, Speaker. On this side of the House, Speaker, we have heard the public. We want to make sure that we have a system that is transparent and accountable. And that is why, Speaker, we want to we have tabled this bill and we want to go and listen to Ontarians. And I hope that the members opposite on the NTP side will agree to a unanimous consent motion, Speaker, so that we can start that public hearing process now. So that we can start listening to Ontarians now, Speaker, and through the summer. I ask Answer. the NDP, are they going to support the unanimous consent motion or not? Thank you. Question the member from Newmarket Award. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, this question is for the Minister of Finance. Minister, Ontario's financial accountability officer released his economic and fiscal outlook for Ontario 
The report forecasts solid growth for the Ontario economy and confirmed the province's budget projection that Ontario can achieve its long-standing commitment to balance the provincial budget in 2017-2018. This balanced budget was first forecast at the bottom of the recession in the budget of 2009-10. Ontario is the only jurisdiction in Canada never to miss a deficit reduction target and to balance according to the schedule set during the recession. Speaker, would the minister tell the House how the province's stewardship of its finances brought Ontario through the recession and pointed it back into the black? Excellent. Thank you, Minister Finance. Mr. Speaker. Thank you to the member from Newmarket Aurora for that excellent question. I would also like to thank the, uh, the FAO and take this opportunity to express our gratitude for the work he's done on his report as well. Over the past two years, the Ontario economy has posted solid growth, with real GDP rising by 2.7 per cent on average in 2014 and 2015. Our commitment to build Ontario up ensures stronger growth going forward. In fact, Mr. Speaker, the FAO expects that Ontario's economy will outperform the rest of Canada in 2016 and it continues to grow over the next several years, supported by strong gains in international exports and business investment. And equally important, Mr. Speaker, is our progressive fiscal plan is positioned for improving long-term economic sustainability. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. You, supplementary. Well, thank you, uh, Minister. Uh, the report from the Financial Accountability Officer has validated the process the province took to getting back to a balanced budget after this fiscal year. Whether bond rating agencies, economists, banks or others, external reviewers have also noted the credibility of Ontario's 2016 budget and fiscal plan. Anyone can slash and burn their way back to a balance, Mr. Speaker, putting the burden on the backs of those least able to afford it. Ontario grew targeted business sectors and steered a compassionate and responsible path back to balance during the past eight budget cycles. Would the minister outline the key components of the province's budget that enabled Ontario to balance its budget, emerge stronger after the recession, and lead Canada in economic growth? Here, here. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, a very well-informed question. <laughs> Let me be clear. We're on track and on schedule to balance the budget by 2017-18 and the year after that. We're making strategic investments in infrastructure and in services that matter most to the people of Ontario. To mention only a few, we're investing $1 billion more in health care, $400 million more to the Business Growth Initiative, and $160 billion over the next 12 years to build roads, bridges, transit, and needed infrastructure. The government is committed to beating our targets and coming to balance through a fair and balanced approach, as we have been over the last number of years. Mr. Speaker, thank you for the question, and thank you to the team on this side of the House. Can you say it, please? Can you say it, please? New question. The, the member from uh, Elgin Middlesex, London. Thank you very much, Speaker. Speaker, my question is to the Acting Premier. Speaker, yesterday the Financial Accountability Officer confirmed that, the, that under this government's economic plan, they are not going to be able to fund the natural inflationary growth of health care spending. Speaker, this means more nurses will be fired, more surgeries will be cancelled, and further cuts will happen to physician services. All these cuts are due to the government's fiscal mismanagement, scandal, and waste. Speaker, Will the acting premier finally admit that due to their incompetence to govern, health care services for Ontarians will continue to be cut over the next four years? Thank you. Thank you, Premier. Well, Speaker, um, as I've said earlier today and the day before and the day before and the day before, we are actually increasing spending when it comes to health care. It is a billion dollars more this year than last year, and I have to say I don't know anybody who doesn't think a billion dollars more is a cut. So, Speaker, we are going to continue to invest more in health care. We're going to continue to make sure our kids get the best possible education. We're going to continue our work to make sure that the most vulnerable in this province has the best opportunities to be successful. We're going to move forward on free tuition 
for uh, in colleges and universities for our low and moderate income family speaker we're going to continue with our agenda and we're going to do it in a fiscally responsible way in a way that gets answer. better value for the dollars that we're spending thank you Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Acting Premier. Perhaps the Acting Premier to see where they're sending the money because it's not reaching the front lines no, in Ontario. And, sure. and unfortunately, today it was announced that Sunnybrook Hospital was was cutting 109 surgery days out of their budget. So cuts are happening, uh, Acting Premier. But last year, this government not only uh, saw cuts to health care, they fired nurses, they cancelled surgeries, they cut physician services. Yesterday, the FAO report brought to light the degree of underfunding the health care system is receiving under this government for the next few years. Not only will hospitals have to deal with budget shortfalls, they'll also have to deal with the decreased revenues from the Ontario Lottery Corporation this government has cut. They have to deal with the high energy rates that are affecting the hospitals. T hospital in Timmins is concerned that the money they received in extra is not even going to cover the cost of their electricity bills. Will the Acting Premier tell Ontarians how many surgeries that will be cancelled and how many nurses will be fired this year due to their underfunding of health care. Uh, speaker, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that the member opposite is falling into the trap of, of uh, not understanding that when we talk about nurses, we need to talk about net new nurses. Collective agreements are written in a way that layoff notice are issues, even if those nurses are rehired That's in another right. part of the hospital. Yeah. So when you talk about net new nurses, 26,000 net new nurses in our system More now. Even there. last right. year, thousands of net new nurses were added. I do find it strange, Speaker, that the member opposite who asked that question is the same person who stood in the way of us cutting the price of generic drugs in half right. for all Ontarians. Right. That action was one example of how we can get better value for money. That caucus, and that member in particular, did not want to cut the price of drugs in half. Sure. So, Speaker, we're going to continue to do Answer. the work we need to do to get best value and best outcomes for patients. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Acting Premier. Uh, Mr. Speaker, last year, Cyan Ruby's Act for Parental Equality passed second reading with all party support. Since then, the government has stalled on my bill, and there are babies being born to LGBTQ parents who are being forced to fight Ontario's discriminatory system. For a decade now, the courts have told the Ontario government that our parentage legislation is clearly discriminatory. It does not recognize that LGBTQ families even exist. As a result, LGBTQ parents are forced to adopt their very own children. Can the Acting Premier please explain why this government won't pass Cy and Ruby's Act and is continuing to prevent the children of LGBTQ parents from parental recognition? Thank you. Thank you. To the Attorney General. Attorney General. Uh, merci, Monsieur le Président. I wanted to thank the uh, member from uh, Park, uh, Dale I Park for her advocacy. Mr. Speaker, this uh, government remains committed to uh, supporting all Ontario's families and protecting the best interests of children. We recognize that modern families come in many diverse forms. We are also aware that use of assisted conception method, such as IVF and surrogacy, are increasingly common. Mr. Speaker, I spent 14 years in the delivery room and this was not, you know, the reality of the time. I realize that it's many years ago. But before any changes are made to parentage laws, it is important to hear from as many people as possible Answer. about their experience to ensure that we understand the needs and circumstances of all families. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Back to the Acting Premier, Mr. Speaker. This government's inaction on this issue has forced LGBTQ parents to take the government to court. You're fighting them in court. The government apparently cannot figure out whether it's going to concede legislation needs to be changed or whether it will continue to fight equality for LGBTQ families. This isn't complex, Mr. Speaker. The government should not be fighting this case. It's a waste of taxpayers' money and time. Will the acting premier commit to ending the discrimination of LGBTQ parents and children and pass Cy and Ruby's Act on parental equality in time for Pride Month? Yes or no? 
seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Attorney General. Mr. Speaker, we support the principle underlying the uh, member opposite bill. That's why this, uh, the Ministry of the Attorney General, in cooperation with other ministries, we will be consulting on this important issue on, over the coming months. Ontario uh, was uh, served uh, with a constitutional challenge to the birth registration and parental recognition provision in the Vital Statistic Act and Children Law Reform. As this case is before the court, I cannot comment on it, but I can tell you that we're serious about consulting because there is different opinion, and we wanted to make sure that we hear from as many families as possible. Thank you, Mr. Thank Speaker. Thank you. New question. The member from Cambridge. Speaker, my question is for the Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. May 19th marks Personal Support Worker Day, a day for us to celebrate the contributions of the approximately 100,000 personal support workers here in Ontario, and I acknowledge those that are with us here today. I've worked closely with many PSWs in my community of Cambridge and the Waterloo region, at the Cambridge Memorial Hospital, and also in my role as a care coordinator for the Community Care Access Centre. But, Speaker, more importantly, there are many families in my community who rely on and value the important services that PSWs provide to them daily. In fact, in the home and community care sector alone, nearly 41 million direct hours of publicly funded personal support services are delivered each year. Speaker, can the Associate Minister please sure. speak to the role that PSWs play in Ontario and the steps that our government is taking to support them as they serve Ontarians? Thank you. The Associate Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Thank you, Speaker. I want to begin by thanking the member opposite for the question. I know that as somebody who has worked herself in the front lines, she understands the important role PSWs play. And I want to also take the opportunity to recognize some of the PSW workers and SEIU work, uh, um, union representatives who are here today. And I want to take this opportunity today, Mr. Speaker, on this day to recognize officially the contributions of personal support workers in Ontario and assure the House that our government is committed to building a high-quality PSW workforce with the capacity to meet Ontario's personal support needs today and for many years to come. We as a government have been a leader in recognizing the growing importance of PSWs in the health system. This includes, Mr. Speaker, our PSW workforce stabilization strategy, Answer. which will see the base minimum wage for publicly funded personal support services in the home and community care sector raised to $16.50 an hour. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Associate Minister for her work on this file. Our government steps towards supporting our PSWs contribute fundamentally to our plan to put patients first across Ontario. During my time as a care coordinator, I often work together very closely with PSWs to help manage and improve the health of our shared patients. More than 34,000 of Ontario's 100,000 PSWs deliver care, assistance and support to our seniors and other people with complex care needs in their homes and communities. We estimate that over 9,000 PSWs work in hospitals and 57,000 PSWs work in long-term care homes. To continue building up these services, it's essential that we work with our partners in the sectors to Question. develop a long-term strategy. Can the Associate Minister please inform the House of what work is underway to strengthen our government's relationships with PSWs? Thank you. Minister. Thank you once again, Speaker, and thank you also to the member from Cambridge for the supplementary question. Our government has ongoing plans to work with the sector so that our personal support workers can continue to provide better service for Ontarians. And that is why, Mr. Speaker, we have developed a common PSW educational standard, which was released in September 2014 to improve the consistency of learning outcomes. We have also created the PSW Training Fund, which provides up to $10 million annually 
annually to support training and education to PSWs working in home and community care. We are committed to a long-term strategy that will serve our PSWs and will build on our initiatives to strengthen the profession and ensure ongoing alignment with the health system transformation agenda. And, sir. and finally, Mr. Speaker, I just want to thank the PSWs across this province because they are the glue that hold our health care system. Thank together. you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question the member from Niagara West Lambert. Thank you. Member. Thanks, uh, Speaker. My question uh, is Minister of, Minister of Finance. Uh, Minister, as you know, in your hometown of Mississauga, they recently uh, voted to ban Uber and ride sharing operations uh, altogether. I, I want to commend uh, Mayor John Tory and uh, members of council support. They, they brought forward some sensible resolutions that are balanced in protecting uh, consumers while enabling more choice in Toronto. The reality is now we have um, Ontario's largest city next to Ontario's third largest city and Brampton may join Mississauga, where you could get into a vehicle, an illegal Uber vehicle on one side of the street, and then preposterously cross the street and be in an illegal Uber vehicle. This, this is not good for consumers, it's not good for drivers, it's certainly not good for business investment. Um, don't you think it's time that we brought in province-wide rules around ride-sharing for clarity, for consumer protection, and to allow good choices for consumers in our province? Question. Thank you. Minister of Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you for the member for his question. Thank you also for corresponding with me last week relative to this very issue, recognizing that uh, the sharing economy is upon us, and I outlined that very clearly in the fall economic statement as well as in our last budget, that we must embrace uh, the issues around the sharing economy in a way that is fair, provides consumer protection, provides business protection, and that is exactly where we're proceeding. We've uh, established a, a, a consulting committee to review the effects and the impacts going forward. We also recognize uh, the importance of the municipalities in engaging in the licensing. Some municipalities have operated differently than others when it comes to the sharing economy and, and with the ride sharing specifically. So I recognize the challenges that are before us and I appreciate the members' uh, commitment to the issues and engagement that we have ongoing as a result. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you, Supplementary. Thanks, Speaker. Back to the Minister. I, I appreciate the fact that he, is, as Finance Minister, helped move forward insurance products for ride sharing. I commend him and encourage him in that uh, endeavor. Um, as the minister knows, uh, Speaker, in Mississauga there are uh, over 100,000 uh, users of uh, Uber. There are 5,000 people on uh, payroll who uh, depend on that uh, income. And they had a, a bizarre system where they had an advisory committee that was dominated by interests from the cab sector. And asking Uber to get their permission is a bit like asking Netflix to get permission from Rogers and Bell and uh, Coachville. It it's just is not going to happen, and it's very much last century. You may recall that the City of Mississauga sent you a resolution asking for the province to intervene and have province-wide standards. I think that's a cry for help, and it's certainly a good change that would benefit consumers across our province. So, Minister, will you take the advice from that resolution and bring in standards across our province to help move this decision into the Question. 21st century and out of the last? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, yes, the member opposite did highlight uh, the conditions of that uh, advisory committee. Uh, that he felt was uh, sort of t uh, tilted one way, and I understand that, that issue. Uh, we have also established our own uh, Sharing Economy Advisory Committee to develop an integrated and a coordinated strategy that will promote a level playing field and tax fairness that fosters innovation and support for new business, because we don't want to hamper economic ingenuity and increasement of economic prowess. And we want to protect workers, consumers, and communities. The member opposite cited the fact that we have before us a review for insurance protection of all those that would be safe in those respective vehicles. We are doing just that by the redefinition of fleet to enable, in this case, Uber and Intac to have an agreement to provide for safety for consumers as well as the drivers. Thanks, we also sir. have Aviva that's done another program to support uh, drivers so that they're properly insured. I have been reviewing what's Thank happened you. in Alberta, recognizing some of that. Thank you. Your question, the member from Niagara Falls. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the acting premier. The Fort Erie racetrack will open for its 119th season on May 31st, and you're all invited to join me there. This racetrack remains the only one in the province that must rely on $250,000 in funding from the town of Fort Erie. There are 29 gaming zones in the province, including Niagara 
but Fort Erie is excluded. The racetrack has a business case become self-sufficient. It supports thousands of good-paying jobs in my riding, 700 direct and 300 indirect jobs. It's an important part of the fabric that makes Fort Erie such a great community. The town supports the track, visitors support the track, everyone in Niagara supports the track. Will this government support the Fort Erie racetrack by including them in the Niagara gaming zone and returning slots and increasing race, race days at our track? Thank you. To the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. And I want to just commend the member for Niagara Falls. I know what kind of interest he has in the horse racing industry in the Fort Erie, Fort Erie area. And we do know that the Fort Erie Reach Track, of course, is the second leg of the very prestigious uh, Canadian Triple Crown, the Prince of Wales Stakes. And during our recent budget, of course, uh, my colleague, the Minister of Finance, extended the funding for horse racing in the province of Ontario from 2019 to 2021 uh, to provide stability wow. Wow. to provide stability which is a very important industry uh, particularly in rural Ontario we have 940 race states in the province of Ontario the fourth in terms of jurisdiction in North America and we'll continue to look at plans for Fort Erie as we move forward with the integration with the Ontario Lottery Corporation of the province of Ontario Mr. Speaker great supplementary Mr. Speaker, back to the Acting Premier. The government claims that the latest horse racing plan will restore confidence to the industry. Confidence that was lost after the government's last horse racing plan failed. We have an incredible amount of development ready to go in Fort Erie, like the Canadian Motor Speedway. And fixing the track is the final piece we need to make sure all that development goes forward. Will this government give the confidence to the people of Fort Erie and the horse people across the province by including Fort Erie in the Niagara Gaming Zone, returning the slots to Fort Erie, protecting the thousands of jobs there, and ensuring the Fort Erie racetrack can be self-sufficient? Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister of Agriculture. Mr. Chairman, to the Minister of Finance. Minister of Finance. Um, Mr. Speaker, thank you. And I thank you for the member for the question, recognizing the importance of the work that has been done uh, recently to, in fact, pass legislation to establish Ontario Racing. An Ontario Racing Coalition that represents the entire industry to facilitate us with the respective funding of $100 million, Mr. Wow. Speaker, that's now committed to the industry. And when it comes to trust, it's all about ensuring trust to ensure that the monies that are being established goes to where it needs to go, which is to the horses, to the breeders, sure. to the people on the, uh, uh, on the rural communities that will benefit who have not actually been taken benefit to date. We are making those changes. We are working very closely with the industry under the industry's uh, cooperation and collaboration. I'm very proud of the work done by the Minister of Agriculture to this point. We'll continue to work closely Answer. for the benefit of the horse racing community on an ongoing basis. Thank you. New question, the member from Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister responsible for Seniors Affairs. Mr. Speaker, I know firsthand that in my riding of Davenport, I'm fortunate to have the number of seniors that I do. My question today is on social integration and the participation of older adults in our society. The participation of seniors in the community is often seen as an indicator of a productive and healthy society, and it is widely accepted that social supports have a strong pro proactive effect on health. However, the opposite is also true. Many seniors may be at, low, at risk of being socially isolated or lonely. This may be due to a number of factors, such as living alone, death of family members or friends, retirement or poor health. We know that seniors want to live longer at home and in the community. Thus, the issue of social isolation takes on a new importance, a significant issue today across the province. Mr. Speaker, would the minister inform the House of Question. the work being done by his ministry to address senior isolation with seniors? Thank you. Okay. Minister responsible for senior affairs. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. I note that the member from Davenport, Speaker, is a very avid supporter of uh, seniors in uh, her community, and I want to thank uh, her for the question. Uh, our government, Speaker, led by uh, our Premier, is dedicated to assisting seniors in living in a comfortable, healthy, safe life after retirement. 
to say, Speaker, that sustaining health lifestyles, providing information, increasing knowledge, and provide plans and programs is at the core of our Ontario Action Plan for Seniors. Like the uh, 263 elderly person centre to the tune of $11.5 million in support, Speaker, uh, centres that are provided at every corner of our province, uh, delivering healthy and active ageing and wellness in the community as well, Speaker. The uh, seniors community uh, uh, Answer. Uh, uh, fairs, uh, speakers, and the 56 community, uh, also community uh, friendly community, so uh, with one and a half million dollars in support. Speaker, the Thank Vietnamese you. community. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker, and I would like to thank the Minister for his response and our Premier for the dedication to seniors in Davenport and across Ontario. Mr. Speaker, I'm very pleased to hear the many initiatives our government is doing, and I look forward to seeing many seniors in Davenport and across this province benefit from these many pro programs. I'm especially pleased to learn that we have programs in place to encourage seniors to stay active in their retirement years, and I know many of these services are provided by the many wonderful organizations in my riding of Davenport. Given the potential harmful effects of social isolation and loneliness, especially in seniors, it is important to continue to pursue this issue in order to reduce emotional damage to seniors that may result. Would the minister please inform the House more about the status of the Seniors Community Grant Program? Thank you, Minister. Uh, again, I want to thank the member for Davenport Speaker. And uh, yes, the Senior Community Grant Program is the first grant uh, in the province of Ontario dedicated solely uh, speaker, for the benefit of seniors. It is intended to give seniors more opportunity to participate in their communities, encourage greater social inclusion, volunteers, and community engagement for seniors. Speakers, the grant go from $500 to $8,000, depending on the stream, and it's aimed in supporting a not-for-profit organization. Under the leadership of our premier speakers, the Senior Community Grant Program has already supported some 544 projects and helped about 116,000 seniors in our province. I have to say, Speaker, that the program now is a permanent program and will continue to uh, Answer. increase the funding as well, Speaker. Now, I have to uh, put in a little bit of a plug for the, uh, uh, for the uh, hard-working staff at Ontario uh, Senior Secretary, right Speaker, for the work. New question, the member from here on Greece. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Environment Minister. Speaker, over the last couple of weeks, the minister has flipped and flopped like a fish out of water. And just last week, the minister suggested in question period that he would cut off natural gas to Ontario cities. And then when he was called out, he backtracked. It's on tape. And then when the Globe and Mail revealed that Liberals do, in fact, have a blueprint to remove natural gas heating from homes in Ontario, they, they backtrack. The ministry is now claiming this isn't the government's plan, despite outlining his intentions to cut it off last week. So, Speaker, is the minister suggesting last week he put his foot in his mouth once again, or is he suggesting the document obtained by the Globe contains no plan to phase out Question. the residential use of natural gas by 2030? Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. I've been very clear. Number one, we are not forcing people off natural gas. Let me say it twice. We are not forcing people off natural gas. Let me say it a third time, Mr. Speaker. We are not forcing people off natural gas. Two, we are working with natural gas companies and many others on extending services, on cogent. There is a great deal of enthusiasm for low-carbon solutions for homes. We will enable that, and we will support the choices Ontarians make. The member opposite has a plan that would cost households $107 a month, Mr. Speaker. That's what it would cost to delink. That's what the carbon tax, $107 a month, Mr. Speaker. The Tories want to bankrupt Ontarians, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. The government uh, house leader on a Never too late. Never too late. 
Come on, House Leader, on point of order. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, I seek unanimous consent to put forward a motion without notice regarding the scheduling of Bill 201, the Election Finances Act at committee, for the purpose of public hearings during the summer months. The government house leader is seeking unanimous consent to put forward a motion without notice. Do we agree? No. I heard a no. I, uh, I do have a very important note to make uh, for all of us. For all of us. For all of us. This is the last day for the pages. No. I would like to offer our pages our gratitude for the wonderful work that they've done. See, we, we, you see, we can be nice together for people, <laughs> so, just so that you go home happy. Uh, there are no deferred votes. This House stands re recessed until 1 p.m. this afternoon.